Hey everybody, John Millen here with Benefit Hackers. I am so excited to have Brandon Dawson on our on our show today. Brandon is an extraordinary person, number one, who's helped a lot of businesses over his career. Uh, we had the chance to meet Brandon uh, about a little over a year and a half ago, and just an amazing person that really is helping the business community when we're going through this COVID crisis, but even last year, and I'm excited to have him on. Brandon, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Hey, John. Um, excited to be on your show. Awesome, awesome man. So, Brandon, I thought we'd uh, I thought I'd ask a couple questions related to what I'm calling um, post COVID tactics. And you've done a lot of great content, a lot of great training and coaching during the COVID issue, leading up to the COVID issue. And I'm sensing that we might be starting to slowly come out of this. Some of the states are maybe slowly starting to think about reopening in a few weeks. And as business owners, leaders, and presidents of companies, I wanted to ask you a couple questions related to that. So first, I want to talk about leadership. As we're as company leaders, as we're starting to come out of this, um, what are some of the things you would recommend leaders think about and do coming out of a very difficult transition, a very difficult situation from a leadership perspective to get their companies ready to maybe coming back into business full time? Yeah, I mean, you know, Leadership is an interesting uh, term, right? I think, I think the one thing that I'm hopeful that every business owner understands today that maybe they discounted it a month ago or six weeks ago is the six words I always use when I'm, when I'm talking about my core values and when I teach, as you've been through it, when I teach how you should be communicating with your employees, inspiration, discipline, accountability, alignment, transparency, and results. If you use those six words, which are the six words in all of my businesses and my personal core values, to me, I want to make sure I use those six words because people need, you know, people need uh, context and contrast. Well, I think every business owner today versus two months ago has both context and contrast. Uh, contrast what it was like to grow your business when it was easy versus what it's going to be like going forward. So uh, business owners that are coming back to work need to take the six words uh, and then understand their employees also need context and contrast. So contrast is the way we used to run the business versus how we're going to run the business. Context is what really worked well and what we need to lean into to get things going again like we did when we started up. So I want most business owners I'm, I'm coaching to think of, go back to the days when they started their business. What were the foundational basics? Um, and then all the things, while well, they've had this window of time to identify they wish they had done. So I, I'm, I'm coaching business owners to make your wish list in reflection. I wish I had cash reserves. I wish I had six months or a year's worth of cash reserves. I wish I had uh, my data was better organized. I wish I had my process better scripted out, better uh, processed out, more agile. Um, while you have this downtime, be thinking about what you wish you had. And then when you restart, make sure that becomes the foundational elements of your success because a lot of these businesses were successful without that, and they will be to a certain size, and then they get stuck in those break points or they get into a decline, a position of decline. If they go back to these foundational elements and make it a focus point, along with what they did that was really well, so that's the other list, everything I did since I started my business that worked really super well, they put those things alongside of each other and they make sure they lean into the things they've already got experience doing really well and they do the things they always wish that they had done differently so they can grow a healthier more stable business not only for them their employees but also for the community in which they serve so that's excellent advice because we use those six principles that you talked about leading into this and i'll tell you it was without getting into minute details it was really helpful so it's interesting that you're saying to continue that same tr trend. Do you think most business owners are reflecting now? Or do you think most of them are like, it'll be the same, just go back to the way it was? I think there's different stages for business owners. Um, 
I'm hopeful they're all reflecting the ones that are talking to me. I've had probably an average of 2,000 business owners a week on my channels. Um, and some are private coaching, some are group coaching, some are in some of our other programs, some were platforming. Uh, but anybody that's watching or listening to anything I say, uh, I'm hopeful that they're assessing the the things that causes them concern today that they wish they didn't have to deal with and ask themselves the question, how do I ensure this never happens again? That in itself, coupled with the things they did that were unbelievable that made them healthy in the first place, putting those two things together will actually protect the business for the next iteration of growth. And I promise you, irrespective of this crisis or a self-induced crisis, and I'm just getting ready to put my book out here probably next week, um, Business um, Response, uh, the, the, the Business Crisis Response Book. Um, and all businesses at some point go through a crisis. It's either self-induced, it's, it's disruptive, uh, disruption in their industry, um, it's from bad decision-making, it's from lack of foundational elements, it's, it's from families breaking off. They all go through a crisis at some point. What this is doing is hopefully teaching people that they can find a way through the crisis and come out better and stronger on the other side. Because I promise you, if you had any ambitions to go to 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, you're gonna encounter lots of crises. And here's the other thing. Most business owners that have started their business in the last 10 years are not what I call wartime business owners. It's been a pretty easy run if you were remotely good at what you did. If you embrace what's happening right now, it's conditioning you to be a wartime business owner, which then your whole perspective changes. And that's a good thing because the rebound on this thing, if executed properly, and the the learned wartime operating scenarios will strengthen you to break through your break points a lot faster and a lot more profitably in the future. So, so when Brandon, when you say wartime, um, are you saying that businesses need to be pressed and pushed and, and have some, some exertion to throw them off kilter to learn what they should learn to get them back on track? Well, it's like when you and I met, you guys were stuck at a million bucks in revenue and you had all this, I mean, let's just be honest with you since this is your audience, you guys were inwardly focused in creating your own issues. Once you recalibrated your thinking and saw a different way that you could put your energy, you guys' business did what? Seven months later. We added, th added three million. Look, there's the hard way and there's the easy way. If you don't have context and you don't have contrast, because that's what I brought you by educating you where your focus should be and what your activity should be in order to accomplish the things that you dreamed of accomplishing. What I did in that scenario is I, then I gave you the process to do it. But I eliminated all the defocus areas that you were spending your energy on that was draining you emotionally, it was draining you professionally, it was draining you financially. And once you made that pivot, your business went through explosive growth and all the things you were worried about, you realized weren't even things that were real. They were fabricated in your own mind because no one was showing you the faster way to do it and showing you how to eliminate the things that didn't really add value in your life. Every business owner is experiencing that to some extent on their own right now. And my hopes is that no business owner ever says to me, no, things are okay, because here's the deal. A majority of the businesses that are gonna go down and not restart because people lost their confidence, it's because they were too comfortable when things were going well. And Jim Collins talks about this in Productive Paranoia. It's the whole thesis on why big corporations struggled and failed, because everybody got complacent and lost Productive Paranoia. Yep, that's an excellent point. And that leads into my second question. Um, so companies that are going from, I'm gonna say zero, because they've really flatlined, some of them a restaurant or other um, haircut salons, gym memberships, whatever, have kind of gone to zero, now could very quickly escalate 
to full throttle. And one of the things I've learned from you is that the people, having the people aspect is so important. So you've talked before about the law of three and the ripple versus the wave effect. Is that, a, is that gonna be a factor as companies start ramping up and coming out of this COVID issue? From zero to full throttle, um, it won't, I don't think it'll really happen like that. I think, I think they'll want it to happen like that, but I don't think it'll happen because a lot of these people have limited resources. They don't really know how to leverage into the resources they have. They don't have great data. So a lot of them are just gonna start over. And good news is they have a customer base. They, 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 if they've had any success, people will start going back and visiting them. That is uh, not an intentional starting over. And so I don't see businesses going from zero to full throttle because I don't think they actually know what full throttle is. They know what their past experience is. That's that contrast. They know, what, they know what they were running at and they know what zero is. Like that's a new perspective, right? So that's, that's given them context. But I don't think they actually know what full throttle is because they don't have that context. They know how to work and be busy, but not necessarily work smarter than harder. The elasticity in a business is working harder, not smart, is working smarter, not harder. That's how you increase margins. That's how you increase cash reserves. So they might start back up and be busy again and feel it's full throttle, but it won't be full throttle. It'll be busy, busy work. Yeah. And some industries, you know, depending on where it is, do you think some industries won't come back at all? I think industries will come back. I think business owners won't. I think, uh, you know, I put everybody into three categories. There's the third that are actually thriving right now and doing well and like, wow, my business has never been better. There's the third that's like, I'm on the edge, but we're still staying in business. We're still generating revenue. We're still covering our expenses. We're, we're, we're not at risk of going out of business. And then I put the third category, ran a sloppy business, margins were too thin, didn't know how to align their people. They're going to, a percentage of those people are going to be like, do I really want to do this? Do I want to, you know, maybe they lost 50 or a hundred or 500 grand and they're like, I don't, I'm not, I don't know where to get that money and I don't even know how to restart. I'm in debt to people. I don't know how to negotiate my deals. I don't know how to get my vendors. I don't even think I can get my vendors to give me a, a line of, of credit because I owe them money from the past. Look, the quality of the guidance and advice that business owners get today will dramatically determine the quality of success they have in the future. And most business owners they're so inwardly focused, they don't know where to go get good advice. They don't know which questions they should be asking and they just do. And they just do and do and do more. And then they, they assume so much that's untrue that that keeps them from actually doing the things they need to do to, to not only survive, but thrive when things get busy again. So I think there are many business owners that are just completely and entirely closed-minded as to getting proper guidance and advice, and they don't know how to ask great questions. Therefore, they just stumble along, and I think a percentage of them will not think it's worth starting back up. You're right. I think a lot of business owners are rugged individualists by nature. They've had to do it on their own. They've been beat up, and so they've learned their own lessons. And I've talked to several recently We've been recommending, and at the end, I'll we'll let everyone know where you, where they can find you. But I've been recommending jumping on your calls because if you're by yourself trying to figure this out, it's even more stressful. If you're in a in a call or a Zoom call with a group of people and you see other business owners there that have the same issues or maybe worse, you can certainly learn from that. So that's that's a gr really good point. And I think business as business owners, we don't have a lot of places we can go and just ask open questions because in our community we may not want to ask those questions, but in the forums that you're offering, it's been really helpful. Yeah, I think most business owners are, are doers. So they're doer thinkers. So they get busy, they do, and then they try to figure it out. Um, I don't think they actually appreciate or understand what would happen if you flipped it to thinking, then doing. Because their experience is the people who are thinkers 
aren't necessarily the people they go to that are thinkers aren't doers. So the guidance and the advice that they get is horrible. And then when it doesn't work, they just default back to trusting themselves. And, and the old adage of who you're spending your time, energy, and efforts around will either elevate your thinking and doing or it will diminish it. And I think a lot of people are trapped in their cycle of relationships. And many of those relationships are not business owners. They're people that seek security over freedom. So anything scary, then the guidance and advice is you shouldn't be doing it or you know, stay small, be small, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. I'm going to pivot to a different kind of question that I think, um, I think people, a lot of people are thinking. So this whole work from home dilemma that employees have been thrown into without choice, you know, maybe it's a, an attorney that's now working from home. Maybe it's insurance, maybe it's whatever. They're still working because they can work from home. However, they're working. What advice do you have for leaders of companies that have employees that might say, Hey boss, I've liked this working from home thing. I want to work from home ongoing or part-time between the office. Any, any thoughts about that? You know, if you uh, have, uh, I don't have an issue with that. If you have the proper confidence in the person who wants to do that, or if you have the proper structure and strategy in place, like for us at Cardone Ventures, Every morning at 8.30, we have an all team on deck meeting. Everyone goes through their wins for the day. They go through their top three priorities for the day. And then they go through anything that leadership needs to know or get involved in or deal with that's required for that day. Then we have timestamps. So whatever projects they're working on, they put the time into the timestamps. So we can see at the end of the day, who worked on which projects and how much time, energy, and effort did they put into those projects? Just like a lawyer would do uh, for tracking and billing their client. So for us, uh, and then we have lots of one-on-ones. Now, if somebody's time trackers aren't being filled in or they're not logging in every morning because 30 minutes before we have our morning meeting at 8.30, at eight, everyone goes into Cardone U. They go through the different modules and then we on the 830 call pick a number out of the hat or pick a name out of the hat and that person has to talk about what they learned in the morning how they're going to apply it in the day in the bigger context of it so if you are running your teams with inspiration discipline accountability alignment transparency and results you can do that anywhere if you're winging it then you're going to have a problem and a lot of businesses wing it and 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 so they don't have the confidence so the single most important thing for every employee for every person they work for is to build confidence into their leadership conversely every single leader in an organization their number one job is to create confidence in the people that report to them if that exchange is happening it can happen in real time anywhere. When that exchange is not happening, it's a recipe, a recipe for disaster everywhere. Okay, let me dig a little bit on that. So I, have a, so I know someone, it's a friend of mine, that is in the legal profession, not an attorney, but a support role, working from home now. And let's just assume the company doesn't have the structures that you've laid out. They were working in the office one day, boom, they're at home. To explain that employee-employer thing with the confidence again. What does that employee need to say to the employer and what does the employer need to say to the employee for that to work? Well, if they just follow the exact process that I just described, you said, well, what if they don't have a process? It's because they're doer thinkers. If, if I was a lawyer, I have to track my time. I would set up a time tracking account for my employee that's home supporting me and I would be assigning them duties, responsibilities, and projects. And I would ask them to do exactly what I do, which is track your time. So I can see what you're working on, what the status is, and what the outcome needs to be. I would have my morning meeting. I would do my morning training. I would have my morning meeting. 
I would have my team working and I could open up those spreadsheets and see what people were doing in real time. And then I would have key performance indicators of things I expected them to do each day, each week, each month. Workflow should not change, but the accountability that you would need to deploy to make sure that you're highly confident your team is working and your team is highly confident you're paying attention, then it works. So the example you gave me is if I was an attorney, I would set up the same time tracker I use for every day and I would teach my employee how to do it and I would know what projects I'm sending them and I would ask them to track the time of the things that they're working on. Awesome. That's really good. Do you mind me asking what time tracker system you use? That's why I have a VP of operations, which is Natalie Workman, because I have no idea. <laughs> Fair enough. So last topic area is shifting into marketing, advertising, branding. Yeah, before you jump into that, remember the first word in the six words is what? It's inspiration. So this is important because if I'm going to introduce a time tracker, I'm sending the message to my employee, I don't trust you. So you have to incorporate the six words. And this, it would sound like this, hey John, I'm instituting this time tracker because it's really important across the whole organization that we all track our time accurately so that we understand how much elasticity we have or how much things we can stop spending money on based on what we're doing and our activity every single day. So we're gonna have our money Monday morning, we're gonna train on these things, then we're gonna have our meeting, we're gonna cover these topics, and then in all of your projects, I need you to track how much time, energy, and effort you spent in each one with a description of what you worked on. Because as we spread out across the country, this is an opportunity for all of us to potentially find a more efficient, more effective way to work. And then if you, you build my confidence that you're handling and using these things appropriately, you call me and say, I'd like to work for a home for a couple days, I would have the confidence to say, no problem, because we have a system that we've worked on. And I think that this is the opportunity to start thinking and doing differently. If we initiate this program and you use it, you could earn that position with us. Is that something you'd be interested in doing? See what I did there? It's the same process. All the time. But you know what most people do? Hey, I don't trust you, so I need you to use this tracker. When we ran into the wall here and the world fell apart, I didn't run in and go, oh my God, everybody, we're going to be out of business. This is horrible. I said, look, guys, here's the deal. People are dependent on us. So we need to be able to inspire those business owners that trust us. It's my job to give you assurances that I've got control of the organization. I'm going to inspire you to give everything you have. Stay focused at a very granular level because we're going to fight to survive every day, 30 days at a time, 60 days at a time, 90 days at a time, and we're going to be working together. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to pay attention to every single detail. We're going to hold our teams accountable to working together, to having each other's back, and most importantly, having our clients back to be available. We're going to step up, actually, the volume of work because we need to help all the clients that are interdependent on us. So, A, we need to be excited and enthusiastic about what we do because we're the front line for all these business owners. If they get on the call with us and we're quoting all the top news articles about the world going to shit, we're going to lower their belief. We're going to lower their aptitude for success. We can't do that. We need to be the opposite of that. Secondly, we need to have our facts. We need to have our details. Thirdly, we need to make sure that we're accountable to being on time, doing everything on time, collecting the right data, displaying the right information. Fourth thing, we need transparency. We need our clients to be able to understand where we're at, what we're doing, and why it impacts them and what we can do in addition to that for them. The fifth thing we need to do with our clients is we need to be aligned with them. We need to be emotionally aligned. We need to be structurally aligned. We need to be uh, financially aligned. So if we have people that are struggling, let's figure out what we need to do to compromise it so that we can help them. And then the sixth thing that we need to do is we need the results. Results are what are going to make and allow everyone to survive. So that was my message going into the crisis. It's my message in the middle of the crisis, and it's gonna be my message coming out of the crisis. My message never changes, nor does my reaction in the moment to whatever is happening. Because the more calm you are as a leader, the more definitive you are as a leader, the more aware you are as a leader, and the more you can focus your team on the things that they can do because you're aware, you're calm, you're thinking, you're strategic, the more you do that with the more pressure applied to you, think about this, the more confidence you create when you, with your team down the road. So I try to view every circumstances 
every circumstance I encounter, I try to view the first immediate thought is, first thought when something bad happens, am I okay? Second thought, are the people I love, are they okay? Third thought, how much time do I have? Do I have one minute? Do I have 60 minutes? Do I have a day? Do I have a week? Do I have a month? Because the more time between the moment something catastrophic happened and the drop dead moment, the more time, the more confidence I have to figure something out. So I can take the pressure and go, I got one solid minute to think here. Um, if I panic, I lose my minute. So once I do those checks, and those checks usually happen instantaneous for me, then the next check is, how do I make sure whatever decision we make from here that goes forward keeps us in survival mode for as long as possible? And then after I do that safety check, the very next check is, what will people say about me when this recovers? What will they say about how I conducted myself? What will they say about how I engaged with them? What will they say about how I helped them? What will they say about the value I added to their life? How can I take this moment, this catastrophic moment, and send the vibrational evidence and factual and, and looking in arrears evidence that I was all in there for people because that's what I'll be known for. So I view this whole thing as I'm a professional firefighter. I have been so trained on firefighting that I am not afraid to run into a burning building because I know how to go in and I know how to get out. So every one of these business owners who sees this fire and are screaming and yelling and panicking, I'm not panicked. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna slice through it like a surgeon and I'm gonna help thousands of businesses because this is actually where I thrive and it's where my training and experience is. Therefore, in calm times, when people go backwards and say, what was Brandon Dawson doing when the world was melting down? Can I trust this guy? I want them to see thousands and thousands and thousands of video clips me answering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions of business owners and me putting out two or three books, what to do in this, when, when, when everything comes to a grinding halt, what to do in the middle and what to do coming out of it. So people go, I wanna be aligned with this guy because if he can do that in bad times, I can certainly trust him in good times. That is my final thought based on the safety checks that I went through. Hey John, the software that we're using to track uh, activity with all of our team is called Harvest. Harvest. Thanks, Brandon. I think that would help people. Last question, real quick. Marketing, branding, advertising. You said on a call that if you look at your sales throughout the year, there's peaks and valleys. And what people do is they want to spend all their money in the valley. And you said, look at your peak, pull it back, spend your money, to then throw the peak further and higher out. Can you, can you say that again and put it in context for today? Yeah, so, so I, this is an exercise, and you guys did the same thing. This is an exercise I love to have business owners go through. Take your last 12 months and just, just create your own little grid and go, you know, uh, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, or 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, or 10, 20, 30, it doesn't matter the size of your business, put them in increments. Um, and, and, and the increments need to be small enough that they're consistent. So don't do 10,000 and 100,000 and never have 100,000, okay? So if, if, if your business, just to keep it simple, does $100,000 on average per month, January it did 60,000, uh, February, it did 80,000. March, it did 120,000. Now you put those together, or 140,000. You put those together and that's an average of 100,000, like this. Then April comes, goes like this, then it goes like this, and then by the time June comes, it's like this. And then July's like this, and then something's like this, right? So you, your graph would represent your monthly revenues. The mistake every business owner that I've ever worked with makes is things are good, 
So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Oh my gosh, things are bad. I need to throw a bunch of resources at it. Oh, things are back up to good. Oh, thank goodness. I'll just keep doing it. Oh, things are bad. And it just, it, 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 it's, it's literally like, you know, all over. So I go back when I'm platforming and I'll go back three years and I'll do that for every single month. What that data tells me is there will be something naturally happening and then there'll be self-induced things like, hey, how come you were like this and then you went like this? Well, because things were so good, I decided it was finally time to take my three-week vacation. Okay, I put a circle, three-week vacation, makes sense. Nothing wrong with that, but now I understand the data point. Now, what about where it goes like this, then it goes like this, and then it goes like this. Well, you know, the month of April, our business always slows down. Why? Well, because the things we sell, nobody wants them in April. Okay, that's good to know. So what do you do in April? And then you look at their marketing spend and you're like, okay, they dropped their bucket in April because they're trying to bring it back up because they're scared, right? Well, Marketing and the timing of marketing and which things you do in marketing don't have a one-to-one -one ratio. I don't do something today that gets me a sale today, usually in marketing. It can in digital and stuff if you're ordering on the internet and stuff. But there are different layers of activities that you can do in marketing from grassroots, picking up the phone, calling existing clients, lunch and learns, getting a group of people together in the community and talking about what we do, direct mail pieces, old school, drop a piece of mail on the, you know, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, you know, you start going through emails and, and, and you go from old school to new school, right? What I try to teach businesses to do, when you can identify consistency over time, kind of this normal ramp rate, that's, that's when people are most excited and most interested in um, whatever you're doing. And when you identify those moments, what I say is take your marketing spend, pull it back two weeks or three weeks at the start of that cycle and spin more into that cycle. At least test it because what I've seen with businesses is that ramp goes much higher. And then spend nothing in the, dec the normal declines. In fact, go, go to purely grassroots calling existing clients. Use those little windows to pull some revenues forward. Create little packages that might be unique and catch somebody you don't currently work with their mind share. Um, use those moments to take your darn vacations. Don't take vacations in your upswing. I see that all the time. Like, why'd you go here? Well, because I like February going to Cabo. Okay, but February is your hottest month. And they're like, well, I didn't know. Now take it the end of March and your business will generate an extra 100K of revenue. Like, like Cause and effect, context and contrast, plotting using data. Just learn some very basic, simple things and you can change the whole dynamic in your business. That's gold because I picked that up on our last call. And so I'm gonna wrap it up with this. This has been so, so beneficial. And I want people listening to be able to tap into um, the different ways they can from you because I know you offer a lot. What are some of the, what's the, some of the best ways? I know you're on Instagram, CarterOnVentures.com. Tell us where are the best ways people can tap in if they're not familiar and are not listening because I picked up this whole trend thing from this last call and I've been in business 18 years. No one has ever told me that. Yeah, well, part of it, part of it is because like what, when we do the platforming, I've been platforming businesses first, first, 1996 was the start of my first business that I started. Between 96 and 1999, I personally bought 127 businesses. To buy 127 businesses, I had to do due diligence on 500 businesses. Well, there was no tools and systems and pivot tools and all this stuff, data harvesting tools back then. I had to learn my own way of doing it. So I would take the financials and I would take a graph and I would do that and try to figure out where were the optimal times to bring value to the business. Um, so what this is, is it's the total sum of my lifetime experience doing hundreds of transactions, franchised thousands of locations, 
building tools and, and resources to help independent businesses grow and scale by identifying the leverage points within their business. So most people don't talk about this because the really super smart people that, that, that are, you know, have their MBAs and stuff, most of them haven't built businesses so that they only teach what they were taught. So if you're, if you're used to being in street wars and, 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 and gang fights, you're gonna have a different fighting style than someone that's professionally trained to do the MMA, but that's your fighting style. So you all of a sudden get out in the streets and you gotta encounter somebody who's a street fighter. You know, it's a whole different game. There's no rules. So, so to me, I, I've, I'm a, that's why I call myself a wartime guy. Like I've been in wartime since I was 26, 27 years old, scrapping to stay alive in business. And you just encounter a lot more stuff if you're aware. And then how I could turn that to an asset is the exercise I try to teach everybody, which is where all my knowledge comes from. And I try to give that knowledge to as many people that care to listen to it. So how to find me. I've got 10X live show on Tuesday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern. I bring in interesting guests and I answer lots of questions. I've got CardoneVentures.com. You can register for any and all of our programs. I've got the B. Dawson Show. I've got 50 podcasts I've dropped on all the, you know, over these subjects. I'm going to create another 50. So I try to give my, you know, my attitude. Um, I worked with John Maxwell and I asked him about using some of his content. And John looked me square in the eye and he said, Brandon, because I trust you and I know you know what you're talking about, you can use any content of mine that you feel you want to use for anything you want to use it for. Because the more I push my content out, the only thing I ask is that you say, I learned this from John Maxwell. Contrast that to some of the authors I've worked with who said, you can't use any of our stuff. Staying small. And consequently, some of those authors are small. They put some great work out, but they're small. I think John's idea about opening yourself up and being available to people and giving as much value as possible is the right way to do it. And that's why I do what I do. And Brandon, we, we really appreciate it. I know from Laura and myself, you've impacted us tremendously. We brought our team back to your, um, it was uh, your 10, 10X 360 when you had the, the classroom events. We're ready to come back again once things open up. I would encourage anybody to tap into to what you do because you have a great heart. You want to help people. You're you're super successful and you're humble and you care about people. And those are some unique characteristics that not everybody today has those, but you have those 10 times over. I appreciate that. Uh, again, I think it's really important. I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize this again. Context to contrast. Growing up when I was in, 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 in 27, 28 years old, I always call it the tale of two mentors. I had one mentor who was so technically profound, built an $8 billion market cap business. I learned so much from that person technically on how to do things, but it was really, really a hard ass on people. I mean, really a hard ass on people. And his philosophies was, when you buy something, this is a direct quote, when you buy something, the first thing you do show up to that business and you shoot the lead elephant to let everybody know I'm the new sheriff in town. That's how hardcore. But this person could move through obstacles and slice and dice and consolidate like nobody I've ever seen. Then I had my mentors who are worth 200 million, 500 million that treated me with love, respect, nurtured me. They were okay when I lost money because they knew my heart was in it. And I had, I, as I got, I started out as the shoot the lead elephant in my first company. And when it sold, I did not feel good about those experiences. I did not make lifelong friendships there. I chose at that point that there is nothing wrong with loving people, treating people with respect, being kind to people. In fact, because I personally experienced it, I believe that that would make me a bigger, more impactful person than just being successful, technically. So what I've done is incorporated both of those so I can be who I am. But if I want people to know me as anything, I want them to know me as an unbelievably successful guy that doesn't necessarily have to do anything. But when the house is on fire, I'll be the first one in for you to save whatever I can save because it's what I love to do. And I think if that's how people think of me, I'm going to have a remarkable continuation of my career. Yep. 
no doubt, no doubt, Brandon, it'll continue that way. Thank you again so much. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person soon down in Miami. But certainly the, the events going on during the week, I encourage everyone to take advantage of those. They're phenomenal. You will learn so much. And you can go as deep as you want to go with Brandon and his team. It's a real deal. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks a lot. All right, bye-bye.